given the complete history of the world and all the laws of nature. And the choice occurs without anything else coming in at the moment of choice and significantly causally influencing which option is chosen. Okay, so that's TDW and determinism. So let me say a few things about this. First, notice that it's perfectly consistent. To say that a choice is TDW undetermined is perfectly consistent with saying that various things about the decision are full-blown determined. So for one thing, it can be full-blown determined that the torn decision was going to occur. Right? So right, you walk into an ice cream store to get an ice cream cone and you go, do, do I want chocolate or vanilla and you're torn. It can be totally determined that you're going to make a choice. You're not going to get to the front of the line and just do nothing. Right? You've got good reasons for choosing something. So it's determined that you're going to choose. It can also be determined that the choice will come from your tied for best options. Right? You walk in, you've got 31 options, and then you narrow them down to two. And when you get up there, you pick one, and it was determined that you would pick from these two options. Um, and finally, it can be determined that the probabilities are 0.5 and 0.5. So the only thing that needs to be undetermined for the choice to count as TDW undetermined is which tied for best option is chosen. OK. Second thing um, about TDW indeterminism is that it's a moment of choice kind of indeterminacy. So imagine that two seconds before the choice, some non-mental neural event occurs in your brain that determines the choice. And suppose that the neural event is itself undetermined. That does not count as TDW undetermined because the choice itself is determined by this prior event. Even if the prior event is undetermined, the choice itself isn't. So it's got to be that the choice itself at the moment of choice is undetermined. Um, and the last thing is that TDW indeterminism is a kind of full-blown indeterminism. This is why I call it wholly undetermined. And to see what I mean by that, notice that there's a sort of spectrum of conceptually possible cases here. Um, so at one end of the spectrum, so you've got these two options. And at one end of the spectrum, nothing comes in at the moment of choice and causally influences which option will be chosen. So the probabilities are 0.5 and 0.5. That's the case of TDW uh, indeterminacy. But we can imagine that there's some kind of event occurs that causally influences the choice without determining it and, say, shifts the probabilities at the moment of choice to 0.8 and 0.2, or 0.7 and 0.3, or something like that. So in that case, we can say that the choice is partially determined, um, or partially undetermined. And at the other end of the spectrum, there's some event that happens beforehand that just full-blown determines it. So the probabilities are 1 and 0. Um, so I think it can be argued that if a torn decision is partially undetermined in this way, it's also partially libertarian free. Um, but I'm not going to try to convince you of that. I just want to try to argue that if it's wholly undetermined in the way I've got in mind here, so the probabilities are e even, um, then it's full-blown l -fray. OK. So that's, um, so one more word. Let me define TDW indeterminism as the view that at least some of our torn decisions are TDW undetermined. OK. So that's all set up. So given this setup. I can now re-say, I can reformulate the thesis that I want to argue. And I've got this on the handout. I'm calling it central libertarian thesis. And it's just this. If a torn decision is TDW undetermined in this way, then it's authored and controlled by us and Elfrey. Um, so putting it very succinctly, the claim is just this. If TDW indeterminism is true, then libertarianism is true. And given that, it's pretty easy to argue that the question of whether libertarianism is true just reduces to the empirical question of whether TDW and determinism is true, right? whether these, these torn decisions are undetermined in the right way. OK. So it takes some doing to argue for central libertarian thesis, but um, I just want to give you two fairly quick arguments. Um, the first. The first argument runs better if we assume um, a token-token mind-brain identity theory. So what I mean by that is just that any given torn decision is a neural event. That's what it is. Um, I think this is a pretty weak thesis. I think it's true. But um, 
I actually don't need this assumption for the argument to work, but it sort of makes it go better. Um, so given that, um, let's say we've got this guy, Ralph, who's trying to choose between two options, O and P. And he's torn, and he makes a torn decision to go with option O instead of P. Um, and now let's assume, for the sake of argument, that the choice is TDW undetermined. So now look what follows from that. Well, the first thing you get, even if it's not TDW undetermined. So Ralph chooses consciously, intentionally, purposefully, in full possession of his faculties. The choice is a conscious choosing event, right? It's a, it's a me choosing now event with that kind of phenomenology. That's what it is. It's also a neural event, but it's also this Ralph consciously choosing event. If the choice is TDW undetermined, we also get the result that the choice flows out of his reasons in a non-deterministically, probabilistically causal way. Um, and more importantly, we get the result that at the moment of choice, nothing external to his conscious reasons and thought comes in and causally influences which option is chosen. Nothing comes in and has any significant causal role there. So we've got, it looks like we've got two results here. We've got Ralph did it, right? It is a Ralph choosing event, and nothing made him do it. So if you have Ralph did it and nothing made him do it, it looks like that's enough for an interesting kind of authorship and control. So there's one little argument. And notice that the, notice that the indeterminacy here is giving you the authorship and control because um, it's the TDW indeterminism that's guaranteeing that nothing made him do it, right? The conscious phenomenology gives you that it's a Ralph choosing event. The lack of an external determining cause gives you that nothing made him do it. So the indeterminism is, is giving you the, um, the non-randomness, which is what you need for libertarian freedom. Okay, second little argument. This, this argument's based on the phenomenology of torn decisions or how they feel to us. Um, and, and here's how they feel. It feels like we author and control them, right? So you go into the ice cream shop and um, you're like, oh, chocolate, you know, I'll, I'll have chocolate. Um, and if somebody asks you, how did that happen? The, the phenomenological answer is, well, I did it, right? So it feels like we author and control them. Now, of course, phenomenological feels like this can be illusory, right? But here's what I think. There's only one initially plausible way in which it can turn out that the phenomenology of torn decisions is mistaken. And that's if, unbeknownst to me, something external to my conscious reasons and thought comes in and causally influences the choice, right? Like some completely non-mental neural event happens in my brain and causes me to choose A instead of B. Um, that would, if that were the case, then we go, oh, well, so maybe I didn't author and control it. Um, but TDW indeterminism guarantees that that's not what's going on. Right, so it looks like if, TDW, if the choice is TDW undetermined, then the only worry you might have about the accuracy of the phenomenology just goes away. So if the choice is TDW undetermined, it seems like we should trust the phenomenology. So we've got a, it, So this gives us another argument for the claim that if the choice is TDW undetermined, then we author and control it, and it's L-free. And again, the TDW indeterminism is what's giving you the authorship and control here, right? And don't think of it like the TDW indeterminism is like creating this new thing, authorship and control. The right way to think about it is that it's blocking a potential destroyer of authorship and control, right? The, the potential destroyer would be an external causal influence that is outside of my conscious reasons and th thought that comes in and, um, and causally influences my choice. But, TDW indeterminism guarantees the absence of that kind of destroyer. And that's the sense in which it procures authorship and control. Okay. okay. So there's two admittedly very quick arguments. Um, now I want to um, <clears throat> just talk about a few objections you might have. So one objection is a sort of famous objection to various kind of libertarian views that people call the rollback objection. And the argument goes like this. Look, what if we, imagine that God rewound the universe and let Ralph make his decision again. Um, if the choice is really undetermined, then um, 
Ralph might choose differently the second time around. And in fact, suppose God did this 100 times. If the probabilities are really 0.5 and 0.5, then we should expect that he'll choose O about 50 times and he'll choose P about 50 times. Um, but wait a minute, you might think. If that's right, if, if without changing anything about Ralph, he keeps choosing differently, then it seems weird to say that Ralph did it. It seems like in any given you know, play of the decision, it seems like just a matter of luck or chance what he chooses. And so it seems like it can't be right to say that he did it. OK. All right, so there's a lot to say about this objection. I just want to say sort of one central thing, and that's this. Um, there's no inconsistency between the claim that Ralph chooses differently in different you know, runs of the universe, and that in each different run, it's him who chooses. There's no inconsistency there. In fact, there's not even a tension. I want to try to show you that they actually, the two things fit together perfectly. Right? And here's why. Imagine that, imagine that God did this 100 times, and Ralph just kept picking O over and over and over. Then we'd think, well, that's kind of weird. Something must be causing him to do that. And since his conscious reasons and thought aren't causing it, something else must be causing it. Um, but if he chooses differently every time, then we'd think, given that he's torn, that fits perfectly with the thesis that it's him who's doing it, because he's torn. Right? So it seems to me that if we actually ran this experiment, and he really chose O 50 times and P 50 times, given that he's torn, that wouldn't undermine the thesis that it's Ralph who's doing it. It would confirm the thesis, because the thesis predicts that he'd choose differently in different runs of the decision. OK, so there's a few words about the rollback objection. Another objection, um, so this is an objection that Dirk Paraboom raised to a view like this that I, when I ran an argument like this in a, in a recent book on this stuff. And on the handout, I'm calling it the agent causal objection. And the objection just goes like this. Look, the notion of control that you're working with is too weak. Um, to say that Ralph controlled which option is chosen um, is to um, say that he caused that option to be chosen. So it looks like control requires agent causation. And since you don't have anything like that in your view, you're not giving us real control. Um, so a couple things. I, I think it can actually be argued that the notion of control actually doesn't require agent causation. Um, but I don't want to try to convince you of that. I, I just want to point out that it, it doesn't matter whether the notion of control requires agent causation. Because, um, well, think of it this way. Uh, we can just give, we can just stipulate definitions for two different kinds of control, right? We can call them AC control and non-AC control for agent causal control and non-agent causal control. And agent causal control, define it however you want. It's, it requires agent causation somewhere. Non-AC control is just the kind of control I'm talking about. It's the kind of control you get in a torn decision um, when you've got a conscious choosing event and nothing causally influencing which option's chosen, so that the choice itself, the conscious choice itself, is the event that settles which option is chosen. So given this, we've got the result that when Ralph makes this choice, he non-AC controls which option is chosen, but he doesn't AC control it. So you might think, oh, so what we need to do is figure out what real control is. Is real control AC control or non-AC control or something else? Um, but I don't think libertarians need to care about this question. Um, I mean, first of all, it strikes me as a terminological question, so it couldn't be that important. But um, more to the point, it's, look, I don't, I'm not trying to argue that if torn decisions are undetermined in this way, then they're authored and controlled by us and libertarian free and like the only senses of these terms that anyone's ever cared about. Um, I'm just trying to argue that if they're undetermined in this way, then they're authored and controlled by us and libertarian free in sort of interesting and important ways that are worth caring about and worth arguing for and that libertarians can hold up and go, look, there it is, a kind of libertarian freedom. Um, so, so I just don't need the result that that I'm getting the one, you know, one and only kind of control. Um, now, don't take me to be saying something stronger than I am here. I'm not saying that libertarians can define authorship and control and free will however they like, right? If they define them too weakly, then the claim becomes uninteresting. But so I need it to be that it's an interesting, important kind of authorship and control. But it seems to me that the argument 
I'm, uh, the argument I'm giving is uh, delivering an interesting, important kind of freedom. I mean, go back to Ralph's decision. We've got the result that it's a, it's a Ralph consciously choosing now event and nothing's influencing it. So that the, the, the conscious event itself with the event with the me choosing now phenomenology is the event that settles which option is chosen. It seems like surely that's at least an important kind of authorship and control. Okay, so there's a couple words of response to that paraboom objection. Um, another objection, I'll try to be quicker with these last two. Um, you might think, look, who cares if the process is determined or undetermined? And this is, this is related to a, an objection that Dennett once raised to libertarian freedom. Um, if you uh, imagine that before the choice, every time you're torn, you're uh, in your brain or a little neural coin tosser, and um, the, the, little, the little device flips a neural coin and sends back a signal, choose A or choose B. Um, so Dennett said, look, if that's how it works, who cares if this little machine over here is deterministic or indeterministic? It just doesn't seem to matter. And I want to say, yeah, if that's how it works, it doesn't matter because, um, because regardless of whether this little machine is determined or undetermined, it's an external causal influence on the choice, right? It's coming in and determining the choice. So it wouldn't matter if that kind of indeterminism was true. But it would matter if TDW indeterminism was true because in that, in that case, you get the event that the conscious event is undetermined, right? So there's, of course, still going to be physically physical undetermined events here, um, presumably micro events, but in the, the view I've got, the physical undetermined events are going to be parts of the mental event, not prior to it, right? So they're not going to be brutally physical. They're also going to be parts of this conscious mental event. Okay, so there's a couple of, um, there's a couple of words about that. So the last objection is you might say, look, who cares about torn decisions, right? You said yourself that they're mostly unimportant decisions about whether to have eggs or cereal for breakfast. What's it matter? Um, so two things. The first, which I don't really care that much about, is that they can also happen with big, important decisions. But the more important point is this. It seems to me that the little decisions are actually more important than the big decisions because of the sheer number of them we make. These are the decisions we make all the time. So it seems to me that the problem of free will is a problem for us because we feel pre-theoretically, we have this pre-theoretic feeling that we have a sort of everyday, all the time kind of freedom, right? And that comes from this sort of mass of little decisions we make, right? We go, oh, eggs or cereal, oh, eggs. Should I ride my bike or drive my car? I'll ride my bike. Should I go to the movies or work through work tonight? It's, it's this sort of constant flow of little decisions that sort of make this important to us. So if any one of these decisions turned out to be determined, and I think it's obvious that at least some of them are, um, it wouldn't really matter. But if they all turned out to be full-blown determined, it would matter, and I think it would be depressing in a way that would sort of be more depressing than if it just turned out that the three most important decisions of your life were determined. All right, so that's a, a few words about that. So how much time do I have left? Ten more minutes. Ten more minutes, okay. So. Um, so, so far, I've, uh, I've just tried to block this philosophical objection. If I'm right, if I'm right that the libertarian question reduces to the question of whether these decisions are undetermined in the right way, then the question becomes an empirical question. And so, you might ask, so do we have any good empirical reasons to believe that these choices are undetermined in this way or not? Um, and I think it's pretty obvious that we don't have any empirical reason to think that they are undetermined in this way. But you might think that there are good empirical reasons to think that they're just not undetermined in this way. So you might, if I'm right, you might think we've got empirical evidence that libertarianism is false. Um, I think that's not right. I think that we don't have any good evidence here. So I think that it's an open empirical question whether these choices are undetermined in the right way. Um, and I just want to say um, a little bit about some of the arguments you might run here. And you know, I only have a few minutes, so I'm just going to be very brief about a few ideas. Okay. So, <clears throat> here's my idea. You might think that we've got evidence that 
our choices aren't, our torn decisions aren't undetermined this way because we've got reason to believe some kind of determinism that rules it out. And what you can do is sort of start very generally and work into more narrow views that just work at torn decisions. So the most general idea is that TDW indeterminism is false because we've got reasons to believe universal determinism, that all events are causally necessitated by the past plus the laws. Um, but we, in fact, just don't have evidence for this thesis. Um, if universal determinism were true, then you know, the basic layer of reality, the quantum layer of reality, would have to be determined. But um, quantum physics is an indeterministic science, right? And there are probabilistic laws. So there are deterministic interpretations of quantum mechanics. And if one of those interpretations is right, then there's sort of an underlying layer, and, and everything is determined. Um, but there are also indeterministic interpretations out there. And the problem is that right now, there's no evidence, there's no good evidence for believing any interpretation of quantum mechanics. So the question of whether um, all quantum events are determined or some are undetermined is just a wide open empirical question. Okay. Um, next, you might zero down a little bit and go, okay, forget about the quantum level. Let's just, you might just think we have good reason to believe macro level determinism, that all macro level events are determined. Or you might think we've got good reason to think that all macro level events are sort of virtually determined, where that just means that um, prior events and past laws made it sort of overwhelmingly likely that that event would occur. Um, and the argument you sometimes hear people give for this is sort of an inductive argument. Look, all the macro level events that we've encountered have been either determined or virtually determined, so they probably all are. Um, Ted Hondrick runs an argument like this. Um, but this argument is, I think, just question begging, right? We encounter all sorts of macro level events that are such that we have no idea whether they're determined or not. We have no idea how to construct a deterministic explanation for these events, right? So, I mean, you can just rattle them off. Quantum measuring events, decisions, um, coin tosses, fallings in love, all the, these events, we have no idea how to explain these in a deterministic way, especially given the idea that the quantum level of reality might be undetermined. Um, so I don't think that kind of argument works at all. Next, you might zero down even more. Since torn decisions are neural events, you might just focus in on the head and go, we've got reasons to believe neural determinism. Um, but again, I think we just don't have reasons to believe neural determinism. If you open up a neuroscientific textbook, um, you'll see that various processes are treated probabilistically, like spike firing and synaptic transmission and the opening and closing of ion channels. And so granted, these, have, these processes might turn out to be ultimately determined. Um, but we have no reason to think right now that they will turn out to be ultimately determined. They might be undetermined. Um, and it's no part of current neuroscientific theory that it's all deterministic. So um, given that, we just don't have any reason to believe that all neural events are determined. And finally, you might zero all the way down to the psychological level and just try to argue that on, for, there's psychological reasons for thinking that, uh, that torn decisions themselves aren't. I mean, not psychological, but just you might focus in on torn decisions themselves and argue that We've got good reason to think that they're not undetermined in this way. So, I mean, one thing you might do here is appeal to sort of standard psychological arguments that show that we're sort of very often out of touch with why we do what we do, and our decisions are often influenced by um, subconscious uh, reasons. So I think that's all right. I don't want to deny any of that, but it doesn't undermine TDW indeterminism because TDW indeterminism is just the claim that some of our torn decisions are undetermined in this way. Um, so it's perfectly consistent with the view that lots of times when you make torn decisions, it's determined by subconscious stuff. In order to undermine TDW indeterminism, we'd have to have an argument that every single time you're torn, um, wait, I thought you meant I had 10 minutes left to Okay. Um, you can always keep your questions before the later. Okay. Um, so let's just, should I just stop? You can either stop now. How, mu how much time is left now? What? How much time is left now? Five. 
minutes. All right. I was going to talk about Libet, but sorry, I misunderstood what you said. All right. Go ahead. I'll stop. Questions? 